So with no further ado, I will uh, introduce you to Raghib Hassan. Thank you. And uh, good morning. Welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Raghib Hassan. I am the founder of uh, Shikak.com, which is uh, uh, a Bengali language MOOC designed for students in South Asia. And in my spare time, I'm also an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So in this talk, I'm going to discuss uh, my experiences in building Shikak uh, as a um, uh, Bengali language MOOC designed with a specific target audience in mind the students in uh, South Asia, in particular Bangladesh and India. But before I begin anything, let's just tell you the meaning of the word shikak. The word shikak means teacher in Bengali. It's a Bengali word. Uh, I guess it also means the same in Hindi and a bunch of other South Asian languages. The shikak project was founded in uh, exactly two years ago, August 1st, 2012. And I established it as a um, platform where interested teachers with different backgrounds, different expertise can come together and teach or share their knowledge in Bengali language with students in Bangladesh and India. So we have a bunch of different uh, people here. We have, um, I think right now we have 40 teachers which, which who are teaching in that platform. They're all volunteer teachers. Some are professors, some are scientists, researchers. And if you look at the picture, you'll see, also see one guy wearing a chef's hat. Uh, is there anyone here from Virginia Tech? If there were someone from Virginia Tech, they will probably recognize this person because he used to be the um, chief executive chef of Virginia Tech. So what are we doing here? We're trying to answer this question. How to change the world by uh, bringing education to the masses? with very little, invest, uh, little investment, little money. We can do that by using the power of social media, the internet, and the crowds. So this is a, a, a atypical classroom in Bangladesh because um, I said atypical because it's too small. Usually the classes are much bigger. Uh, I remember when I was growing up in Bangladesh back in the 1980s, I was once in a classroom which had 100 students in a much smaller room, I guess. But um, these are the problems in rural Bangladesh in particular. The students in low income, uh, from uh, the low income segment of society who are in rural areas, they don't have access to quality education. Sometimes they don't have even access to any teachers who can teach science and technology and math. So um, we have this huge problem that we want to provide top quality education to all these students. But Bangladesh, as you know, is not a rich country, so the government cannot provide all the infrastructure for providing this education to these disadvantaged students. So how can we solve this problem? To give you some more context about the scale of the problem, uh, it might be surprising to some of you that Bengali is actually the fourth largest uh, language in the world in terms of native speakers. There are about uh, 300 million uh, people in, the, in Bangladesh and the Indian state of West Bengal who speak Bengali as their native language. And in many cases, um, uh, a, l a large portion of these 300 million people live in rural areas. They maybe have schools, one school every few villages, but the schools often lack teachers because the government obviously cannot afford to uh, put a lot of money and resources for um, these purposes. And the problem is more acute in higher education because uh, there are so many students every year who want to, uh, who graduate from school and want to enter universities, but there are only few positions. Uh, right now there are hardly 50,000 positions in Bangladeshi um, universities for incoming freshmen, but there are more than 300,000 to 400,000 students who want to enter these positions. So a lot of the students have no choice other than to dropping out of um, college or uh, dropping out right after the high school level or even after the primary school level. How can we solve this? Our solution uh, is to create a highly localized context sensitive uh, or culturally sensitive MOOC in Bengali language, which gives us a hybrid internet and non-internet uh, based delivery mechanism to deliver our content to the students. And to do that, we use the power of crowdsourcing both for content generation and also for deployment and marketing and getting our content to the students. 
Uh, <clears throat> if we wanted to start this project 10 years ago, that would probably not be possible. Because um, in Bangladesh, uh, even today, not a lot, a lot of people have access to computers. But today, a lot of them have access to mobile phones. The uh, mobile phone penetration rate in Bangladesh uh, this year is about 70% or close, more than 70%, which means a lot of these people, um, I have data from last year which shows that 100 million people in Bangladesh have mobile phones. These mobile phones are not smartphones, but they ha do have the capability of displaying small videos, playing audio, and so on. So we want to leverage this uh, the availability of mobile phones in even in rural areas to create a Bengali language MOOC, which is highly optimized for mobile devices to, in order to reach these rural students and non-traditional students. At the same time, we don't want to just depend on the internet, uh, so we want to create a mechanism, a supply chain for providing, taking all this content to all these students who do, may, may not have access to the internet or not even mobile phones. Now the question is, why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? Because there are so many nice MOOCs out there that have been, um, be, that were being uh, developed in the last say, five years. What are we doing that's different? Well, if you look at the MOOCs, the MOOC development, the major MOOCs that are developed in the last few years, you'll see that most of them were developed for English speakers, for students who understand English. Uh, for example, right now Coursera has 709 courses as of uh, today, and 86% of them, that is 609 courses, are designed or delivered in English language. The Khan Academy, which is uh, very famous for creating these web-based video tutorials, that are, uh, their videos are also originally created in English. Now the problem is, uh, only a few people, a few of the students, maybe 5% of 6% of the students in Bangladesh have the necessary or required knowledge of English that they would require to understand these lectures that are given in English. Even people who can understand English, they actually prefer uh, tutorials that are in Bengali language, their mother native uh, language. And I've talked to students uh, in Bangladesh at different levels, and the general idea I get from them is that, um, first of all, they prefer lectures and lessons to be in Bengali language. And also, a lot of the uh, material being taught in these MOOCs does not make any sense in their local culture. That is, they, they would prefer uh, content that have been developed with the local cultural cues and teaching techniques in mind. And also, uh, most of the students in schools in particular, they, they definitely want to learn, but they also want to pass the tests. So they would like to have material that, are, that is designed with the Bangladeshi uh, education system in mind, the syllabuses that is specific to the Bangladeshi education system. So with this in mind, um, uh, we developed Shikok, but uh, let's, let me also give you some numbers out of some studies we did recently. Uh, I asked students um, what, if you're given the choice of learning through a Bengali language book versus an English language book, what, which one would you prefer? Overall, we can see that 59% uh, of the students prefer a Bengali language book versus only 17% who, would, um, who are fine with an English language book. I, bro I broke it down according to the um, uh, educational level of the respondents, and we found that um, at the high school level, or school level, an overwhelmingly uh, large number of students, 71% prefer Bengali, over just 15% uh, of those who would like to, um, who are fine with an English language MOOC. As people get more, get more education, say undergraduate degrees or graduate degrees, masters or PhDs, their um, preference for Bengali falls slightly, but still it's above 50%, even for people who are no English, who have uh, graduate degrees. And we also, we also looked at um, the educational, the age the breakdown. You can see that uh, younger people who uh, have not mastered English yet, they are more interested in Bengali language MOOCs, Bengali language content, whereas um, as people grow older, 
it kind of levels off at 50% uh, in terms of preference for Bengal language MOOCs. And then the other question I asked um, people or was that if you are given the choice of two MOOCs, one is an English language MOOC which has been dubbed into Bengali versus another which a, a native Bengali speaker has developed uh, with the knowledge of the local culture, local jokes and everything, which one would you prefer? As you can see from here, more than 62% of people are interested in locally developed content. Over just 30% of, uh, over just 8% of people who would prefer a top one. So what does it tell us? This tells us that people would like to have content that have been developed locally versus content that have been developed uh, for the whole world and just translated into each language individually. So when we started Chicago.com, we had these requirements in mind, and we decided that the education medium must be totally in Bengali. It should be also be highly optimized for mobile phones, because that's where what device most of the students would likely to have. And then um, the whole process should also take very little cost, because there's obviously not a lot of investment in education sector in Bangladesh. And it also must not depend, on, uh, depend solely on the internet to deliver the content. So there are many challenges in this project. For example, how do we find the best tools and design principles? What kind of videos would work best in this situation? How do you find the teachers? Uh, since we are a virtual organization, we don't have a physical presence, so all the teachers are spread all around the world. How do we find and coordinate them? And then how do we get to the students um, that we are targeting? The first challenge is definitely cost. Uh, as a professor, I don't have millions of dollars uh, every year, so um, how do you fund this thing? Most of the popular MOOCs have millions of dollars of venture capitalist funding, uh, $22 million for Coursera, I think a few years from a few years ago, but probably it's more than that now. And in Bangladesh, there's obviously no such funding. How do you fund this thing? And then the language barrier is important because most of the target audience does not, uh, they don't speak English. Even they speak English, they would prefer Bangla. And then uh, how do you find the teachers? How do you reach the um, uh, stakeholders? All these are technical challenges. Our solution to this problem is to explore different uh, HCI methods and um, um, iterative design uh, and rapid prototyping to figure out what's the best way of teaching um, uh, in such a situation. And then we also look for extreme penny pinching methods to find out how can we design the whole platform at a very low cost. We also use, uh, make a extensive use of social media for everything, for finding teachers, finding students, uh, announcing our, uh, and getting our content, all everything to the students. And finally, our last solution is to use non-internet based supply chains to deliver the content to the rural students. Uh, I'll skip the part about the design strategies, but basically we uh, try out uh, different prototypes of lectures, for example, longer lectures versus shorter lectures, lectures with a interactive quiz, lectures without that, and so on. We are, and through this rapid prototyping and measuring the student response, uh, we try to figure out the best way of reaching uh, the students. And then about the cost, the whole cost of the platform over the last two years has been $15, the price of three Big Macs. Why is it so little? Because um, we don't have a fancy website. It's just a WordPress-based uh, website. And I tried to find the cheapest host out there, which is $5 or maybe $10 per year, which gives you just 100 megabytes of space. But we also found a lot of uh, free web resources such as YouTube, Vimeo, and many, many other generous companies who hosted our content for free. So with this small investment, we're able to reach uh, 20,000 students in the first six months. Uh, right now, the number is um, at least uh, four times or five times that. And over the last two years, we have developed and delivered 55 courses. Every day we have uh, about 4,500 to maybe 6,000 lecture views from 3,000, uh, at least 3,000 unique visitors. And that's just the website uh, I'm talking about, the internet-based um, channel I'm talking about. 
So um, we also use whatever free technology that's out there. For example, we use Google Forms and Google Scripts to design a quiz system that, uh, that uh, automatically email the results back to the students. Uh, so all the free technology out there is really useful if you're trying to design a MOOC for $15. And everything was crowdsourced from all the from the site design to the um, courses to get the teachers. I announced on Facebook and other social media. And on the first day, I had 10 volunteers who signed up to teach courses. And then by day two, we had two courses running. By say week uh, eight, 15 courses. Right now, after 24 months, we have 55 courses in our website. Now a major challenge is, okay, we have all this content, but how do we deliver this to the students? How do we get the content to the students? So how internet, obviously, a lot of the students in rural areas will not have access to the internet. So how can we deliver that? We have three approaches for doing that. The first approach is if students don't have internet, maybe they have mobile phones. So we took our videos, uh, made them into 3GP format or mobile friendly formats, and uh, given, uh, gave those videos to mobile phone vendors in rural, rural shops and rural bazaars. So people go to bazaars, and usually a lot of people go to bazaars and these mobile phone shops to load uh, music videos on their phones. We said, hey, we have these free lectures, and if you're a student, you're interested, you can get these lectures from these mobile phone shops. Maybe the mobile phone shop will uh, charge maybe five cents per video, or less than that. And that uh, an interesting student, even in rural areas, can afford that much money and load that video in their mobile phones. The next one was partnership with uh, cable TV operators. And that was interesting because um, we're not talking about cable TV networks, uh, because that would be a huge thing. But we're talking about these um, rural or um, um, small city uh, cable TV operators who distribute the content. We went to them and gave them our content for free. They are really happy because they're getting the content for free. And they could start a channel just for Shikok. And then they could show maybe ads on the channel or anything. They could do whatever with that. But as long as they were showing our videos, this served our students as well as us. And the third solution is for places where maybe the students don't even have um, any mobile phones or anything else to play the videos. In that case, we provided the videos to schools and we are not assuming that the schools will have multimedia projectors or anything. So we, po we uh, stuffed all our, a lot of our videos in this uh, mobile uh, 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 or SIM cards or me actually memory cards and put them on Raspberry Pi devices. So we gave that, these Raspberry Pis to schools. All they have to do is to find a, maybe an old, unused TV. Uh, and they can connect this to the TV and they can have these video lectures. So um, we also figure out, out uh, different users' engagement studies that if you have a commenting system based on social media, that really gets people interested and um, leads them to discuss more. We also figured out social media marketing strategies. Um, we found that there's an actual optimal time for posting announcements about our courses, which is 10, 10 30 p.m. at night during weekdays. Any other time, people will not notice any content. So what we have achieved in this project, we have demonstrated that uh, it's possible to uh, have more impact if you have localized strategies based on local cultural context and local languages than a one-size-fits-all solution for the whole world. And we also created a design set of design principles for um, creating this kind of um, mobile-based content delivery systems. Um, uh, we found which uh, kind of video lectures work and which do not. And then um, we, the biggest thing we have achieved here in this project is to create a micro lesson model which can be replicated in many other developing countries which have limited resources as uh, Bangladesh. So uh, time for some results, some numbers about our impact. We started in August 1, 2012, which is exactly two years ago. Right now, we, we have 55 courses, and all these courses are on, are on a lot of different topics. We have school uh, syllabus cu curriculum courses, such as math, science, and so on. 
We also have advanced courses such as uh, CalSAR Nanotechnology, which is taught by an expert in that area. And then we also have um, a course on learning chess, a course on learning the Korean language, and finally, a course on French culinary arts, which is taught by the Virginia Tech chef. So we don't require our students to register. So they can, anyone can just go into the website to, to look at things, uh, look at our lectures. But we do request them to, maybe it's a good thing to figure, uh, register. So we request uh, that if they could register, that's good, but they don't have to. So, so far we have 80,000 registered students. And the actual number of students is much bigger. We have um, uh, close to 500,000 um, uh, returning visitors who come to our sites from time to time. And our, in, in each of our courses, we have 4,000 or 5,000 uh, um, people. Each, each of the popular courses, we have up to 5,000 people who have actually signed up. And then uh, the total number of unique um, visitors uh, in the first two years is 1.2 million. And when we just delivered our 3.8 millionth lecture uh, last week. Uh, and then uh, we are getting uh, about 5,000 to 6,000 uh, uh, lecture views per day. And, um, uh, but the most important thing that really matters is that we are able to serve a community which, are, which was outside the education system. For example, I get emails like this from students in Bangladesh who said that they wanted to study a lot of different things, but they were not able to um, study that because of poverty or other causes. And in the last year, we got a few awards from Google or, and the Internet Society and so on. Right now, we have our set of future goals for this year to create um, math and science courses, science courses for the school system in Bangladesh. And to reach at least uh, 200,000 students in 100 schools through our offline distribution mechanism. So summary of lessons we learned from this project, four lessons. The first one is it's possible to design successful MOOCs at a very low cost if you use the crowdsource model of creating MOOCs rather than the uh, centralized model other MOOCs have taken. And then um, user-centric designs work well and if you want to use, reach the um, rural students, um, non-internet based um, delivery methods really work. And finally, but most importantly, localized uh, native language education is perhaps much better than uh, a globalized English language um, uh, teaching method that most other MOOCs have taken. My ending thought is educating millions at a very low cost is possible if we take a localized approach. And if you're interested to see uh, shikok.com in action, you can visit that. It's in Bengali language, so maybe you'll need a translator. And I'll um, just give you a quick demo of the courses we have. This is a course for. What we, uh, maybe in response to a question, we can do that because we're past the, uh, sure. the presentation time. Sure. So, but we can look at some of the um, examples as part of the. Sure. Sure. Thanks for having Now, thanks for listening to the talk, and uh, feel free to start the discussion. Great. So the next part of the discussion, first off, are there any uh, questions for Raghi? But if you want to see the demo, we can do that next, too. I just wanted to honor the time sets that we had set. Uh, yeah. I'm a little bit curious about the uh, community model, how you found you come instructors join us here? to teach, how the instructors collaborate, how you bring them into the system. Can you talk a little bit more about the crowdsourcing community model? Well, um, I have to thank Facebook and other social media for that because um, I find uh, teachers uh, through the social media. We have a pa page for this project, which has, I think, 30,000 or more people who like that page. Through that and through um, my followers in Facebook, I can reach a large number of um, um, people who are interested in uh, uh, educating in uh, Bengali language. And also, sometimes I would also reach out to experts in some particular domain, for example, uh, the chef from Virginia Tech or someone who knows neuro, um, neuroscience or Cassandra technology, I'd reach out to them and I'd request them to create a course. And our courses are highly decentralized because the, all the uh, content creators, the teachers are spread all around the world. So they create their own videos in their own time. We do have a uh, kind of an, like a technical advisory group that helps in creating or, or in educating these teachers 
about uh, the technical stuff for creating the videos. But other than that, um, most of the collaboration among the teachers would take place in social media. Are there typically sort of in the case you mentioned there are one instructor creating one course? Is it ever the case that a large school of teachers collaborates around the course, a single course? If so, how do they you know review each other's work and sort of pilot things like that? How do the dynamics work there? Uh, I actually prefer uh, that a course be, be, should be taught by one teacher because otherwise students get kind of confused if they have too many people teaching different stuff. So um, we did have um, um, maybe a couple of courses that were team taught, but still that were, those were small teams, like for example, two or three people. And um, they they collaborate uh, through maybe Skype or other um, digital media um, to help each other in creating those contents. So I actually think that raises a really interesting question around you bring up crowdsourcing mm -hmm. to create the content. And Piotr, you're bringing up another idea, which is using a different kind of crowdsourcing, not just to, The wiki model, I guess. Yeah. So I'm curious of other people. Um, I don't know. I, I can't recognize all your papers by your faces. So I'm curious if there are other people in the room that have tried alternative methods for sort of crowdsourcing or collaborating around content creation that you'd like to sort of share with the group. Okay, so does anyone, does anyone have a, I don't know where, where your expertise in the room is. Yeah, go ahead. I would just comment, um, I don't think Safe Rayon is here. Um, so Safe Rayon uh, runs 801 and 2 x MIT, these are introductory physics courses, and he's sort of had a long-standing relationship with teachers who enroll in the courses uh, that actually offer up their services in terms of curating content, uh, reviewing material, all kinds of things that are really are happening quite naturally but completely unexpected. Uh, and, and part of the plug that I'll do for my talks later is that that kind of work and, and having seen Safe Cookies Interactions uh, it had us release surveys asking how many people are teachers. And actually one in four identify as a teacher. Right? And it goes down, I think, to people that are current teachers is one in 20. I mean, these are sort of shocking numbers uh, in terms of when you think of thousands of participants. Uh, I think it really reframes uh, how, we, how we look at content, course creation, and all these things. Um, we should be harnessing. Uh, the collective potential of this group. Yeah, which is part of what your project yeah. was doing, was harnessing yeah. the collective potential. That's another example. One thing we are also doing was to encourage people to be teachers, because in many cases, someone is an expert on a particular topic, but they don't have any previous experience of teaching a course. So what we do is to give them guidelines on how to create lectures. Some people are very shy, and they, want, they don't want to appear in front of a camera, so we teach them how to create um, uh, screen casting and record lectures in that way. So we basically guide uh, people uh, who are maybe in initially reluctant to teach courses, we kind of guide them about teaching uh, styles, teaching techniques, and creating these courses. So, yeah. oh, um, so we had a project, I'm, I'm Ed Kutra, I'm at, at Microsoft Research in Bangalore. Um, and we have a project that's actually it's slightly different. I mean, we're looking at technical education, looking at third tier colleges, technical colleges, things like that. And so the, the thing that's interesting that I think is relevant for this, that might be interesting to talk about, is the way people talk about what they want to see from the source of the, of the uh, information. And in fact, what they actually watch and enjoy watching. And so there's this idea of source effects about you know, who is teaching and what's there. For instance, one of the things that we were interested in was you know, when we first designed our system, it was to create stuff that was taught by local teachers. Um, and, and our thing is all sort of like it's meant to be for actual undergrads. And so they're, they're in the course and they're taking it. And one of the things we found was that um, there's something very aspirational about say the Stanford professor or something like that. And so they'll say, you know, what I want is the Stanford professor. And yet when we sort of watch how the behavior is, they can't understand him very well. Mm -hmm. And they have to like repeat it over and over and all this kind of stuff. And so there's this mix of this aspirational thing versus in fact what um, is probably the most useful. And then we, mm -hmm. we extended that further to say, well, what about students? And sort of peer learning. What if you get a, a student to teach 
a given concept on the platform and use that. And what we found there was that they really like the students when it's a particular problem type. Because the students can get right to the nub of when you do this problem, this is what you gotta know to do this thing. And the teachers tend to digress about you know, all the tedious actual foundational reasons why you should know this and stuff like that. Um, and so it was, I mean, I just, I wanna bring that up because I think it's an interesting distinction when you ask people they say one thing, and then when they are sort of performing at something, they go a little different. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Ed, is because, Raghib, you did ask people, and, you, and they still told him they would prefer um, a locally developed. And what you're saying is those numbers might, might not even accurately represent as much that preference is. Yeah. No, 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 I'm saying that what, what Ed is saying actually uh, not only confirms what Raghib is saying, but makes it even more extreme. Because if you ask someone, and they're more likely to say, I want this, but then what they really use is something that's locally produced. And so that you, we might say that your numbers aren't even as, uh, don't demonstrate the effect as, as much as as uh, it actually exists, that your percentages, there might be a higher percentage of people that actually would benefit more from the locally produced language. Yeah. Language issue is very clear. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Language, I mean, language and that culture that, issues. Yeah, very yeah the English, yeah. English issue. So I, I can be a devil's advocate, and I can say that, I mean, they might appreciate Bengali more, but in the long run, they need to learn English. Yeah if they're going to participate in the context. But most of them will never use in English in any context, uh, student in rural areas. They just want to learn the topic and maybe make a living. They're not going to participate in internet discussions. They're not going to no, go abroad. No, just out. in the workforce, right? So I'm in the state of Bengal and India did this experiment. Primary education was mm -hmm. made compulsory in Bengali. An entire generation was left out of the workforce. Three decades after that, they still haven't caught it. I, I, I agree, no, and I understand the point you're getting yeah. to. <laughs> um, definitely, these students are learning English, but they are not le learning English to be fluent speakers in English. Right. <laughs> Just participate in the workforce at yes. some level. And I'm not saying, because this reminds me of, there's a lot of work that happened on same text subtitling, mm -hmm. which you can do, and they can pick up English as they're watching the lectures, mm -hmm. for instance. That might be something that can be incorporated here. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, I mean, this is great. What you're doing is, I mean, it's brilliant. I'm not saying. It's just that what we're also putting some way of, you know, mm -hmm. the workforce participation aspect. So, so I think that it depends on what the learning goals are. Yeah. Like, is the learning goal, and what the learning goals are would <coughs> determine whether you uh, focused on that. So I think there's some other ideas coming back there. Yeah. I actually have questions for, I guess, the group for everybody. But um, the emphasis on teacher training in some ways differs from what you were describing, which is actually sort of an emphasis on teaching students to train, um, and isn't necessarily what your project is all about. It's much more sort of direct to consumer or to mm -hmm. student education. Um, and I wonder whether people think there should be more emphasis on teacher training in these environments, or because uh, there's sort of either trade off there that has to be done. And I also wonder whether. The, the actual tools used can be directed more towards having students engage in a way that allows them to sort of continue this beneficial cycle, mm -hmm. um, or, or not, whether that was intended, whether that will be intended. Um, because I think that that kind of localization where the student actually, for instance, translates uh, is key. So you're suggesting using these same tools to put them in the hands not just to crowdsourcing the teachers, but mm -hmm. crowdsourcing students to also become teachers. And I think you were, you were doing some of that, Yes. Right? So, okay. for example, um, if, uh, I have reached out to students who are good at programming, and I asked them, hey, why don't you teach a, maybe a course in Ruby or Python, which you, you know really well because you just took a course and you are maybe working in a software company part time. Why don't you teach a course? And often they would say that uh, they have never taught such a course, they don't know how to teach a course. So the next thing we do is to get them in touch with uh, someone who's experienced in teaching such courses. And through this kind of uh, peer teaching, uh, the students uh, get to learn how to develop these lectures. And uh, another point uh, I have not mentioned is to how, do, how to create the lecture videos. Uh, many people think that they'll need a studio set up or anything like that for lecture videos. But in fact, we found that even a screencasting or even a webcam is good enough for creating effective videos, as long as the content is good and the um, teaching is locally um, contextualized. 
more. Yes, audio definitely. Is audio is important. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I don't know if this is what he was getting at, but there's also this idea that you could be further achieving your goals by providing teacher training programs right. to <laughs> to that local population. So then that person, you, so you mentioned, you know, teacher shortage is a big Which issue. is one of the biggest issues. Exactly. And, and so, then, so then that person could go on and reach more people face-to-face face -face instruction. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the government of Bangladesh has created a portal for teachers where, which at first sight looks like something like this, but it isn't because there, teachers post their lectures, but these are not for students to see. These are for uh, their peer teachers to see and criticize, critique, and then uh, the teachers are supposed to learn from each other. This is a UNDP funded project, and I think that's also something we might consider in future. Oh, so many, so go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, Another interesting point I was curious was you mentioned this delivery mechanism of online videos using mobile phones and mobile shops. So, is there also some work being done to indicate feedback mechanisms to do quizzes or things like that? They want to ask a question uh, in this offline mechanism. So, uh, yeah. using mobile phones. So yeah. I'll just I would repeat the question because they can't hear sure. it. So, so the question is, I think I. Tell me if I get your question wrong. So you're using these um, mm -hmm. technologies to be able to disseminate information, but how do students give feedback? Or how do they get questions answered? Or how do they, I would even extend to say, how do they demonstrate that they're getting what it is that you're hoping they're going to get? So um, we are trying to design systems of getting collecting this feedback through text messages. So maybe a student watches a video on their phones, and then they can text a particular number. Uh, with some uh, answers or quizzes, or maybe it's their own questions. But still, uh, we, this is so new that uh, we're trying out different techniques. And another thing we're um, going to uh, test out in the next uh, year or so is to actually engage the local schools, give them our content, then uh, collect data about student test scores before and after they have used our content. And maybe after a year, we can uh, figure out how much impact the content has. Yeah. I'm curious, has anyone else used, um, like in low bandwidth situations or mobile devices, feedback mechanisms like you're describing? So has anyone else been doing that? We, we have this exact issue. And one of the things I would say is that in, in our context, we think of it more as a continuum of access. Because I mean, almost everybody who has a mobile plan, it's all prepaid. So, so all of your data is prepaid. So you have to think about that differently from the North American context, mm -hmm. where you sort of have an all-you-can-eat kind of situation. There, you're thinking about every byte costs you some money. And as a result, at least for our students, one of the things that, that they're very interested in, they're willing to spend a little bit of money, but not the amount of money it's going to cost to stream. Mm -hmm. And so what they'll do is that they'll go and say, go to the, we have a, a system set up so you can cache the stuff so when you're <coughs> on campus they'll cache a bunch of the uh, movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then they don't mind spending a little bit of money to get online for doing text kind of interactions and things like that. And so you can start blending these things a little bit where you're not costing them a huge amount of money for the video content, but it costs a little bit to engage in, say, a low bandwidth website that you can do things like quizzes where you can actually make sure that the person is who they say they are and that kind of thing. Yeah, same. I mean, so this is not the Spinani Foundation. So we are doing something similar with a telecom provider in Jordan for a pilot. And what we're doing is, if you have a data subscription with that provider, accessing our site and downloading streaming content doesn't cost you anything. Exactly. Like Wikipedia Zero or other... Wikipedia Zero, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. actually what inspired yeah. And I mean, we're still piloting and it's not perfect. Just because, I mean, we're using Open edX. Everything is hosted on YouTube and trying to sort of white label YouTube videos as an issue. So we're trying to see, you know, do we host them on Amazon servers and have people download them for free? But that's something we're trying and people are very receptive to. Okay. So that's a great solution for the streaming content. Have you, do you have a solution you're using for doing the interaction? I mean, so for us, we were white, so actually the interaction is very easy to white label, to access for free because it's actually on the site. So any, anybody that has a sort of a data package with that specific telecom provider can access our site already for free. Anything, whether it's sort of the feedback, the discussion forum, doing the tests, everything is completely for free. Big caveat, have, assuming you have a data subscription with that telecom provider, and it could be as low as sort of two or three dollars. But for some people, it's still a barrier. Uh, the issue becomes with the video because they're streaming them on YouTube, which is an issue. So we did similar surveys in Senegal using Medic Mobile, which is actually a healthcare software, not education data whatsoever. 
but they were all by SMS, and there's some SMS forms. Maybe Can you speak up? Sure. So when you had a data plan that was via a data connection, you had forms using OEK or other data lists, but when it was just by SMS, you could actually have the exact same content, at least as far as the quiz or questionnaire was concerned, delivered by SMS. Uh, and the providers ensured that all of the SMS coming from a given source were provided free of charge, and responses were also free of charge, so you had public health providers to represent Senegal able to access the system. I think you had another uh, contribution? Well, yeah, sorry. Um, so, I think I have a question uh, not related to this current discussion. But it's not like, um, so in terms of popularity, what are more popular, like English language courses or like technical courses? That's question number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is like, uh, in terms of long-term vision, do you plan to introduce like English language courses at the secondary school level and the university level, so that as generations go through, it will become more fluent in English? Mm -hmm. So is well, that such a long-term vision? That's question number two. Number one is like, in terms of right now, what's more popular English language courses or technical courses? Well, people are more interested in technical courses. In particular, uh, I found that people right now are very interested in mobile application development. We have uh, five courses on that, ranging from people who don't even know programming, how can they use App Inventor to create mobile apps, to uh, all the way to Java and um, C, um, uh, C++ and other languages to create uh, mobile apps. So these five courses are very popular. We have at least 4,000 to 5,000 students registered in those courses and many more looking at the content. And um, topics such as uh, uh, maybe English language. We have, do have a course for in teaching English, which is definitely taught in English. So that uh, is targeted for uh, high school students of a particular cl class. And that uh, they do have students, but uh, they, that's not as popular as having 5,000 students sign up for the course. And to answer your second question, definitely that's something we might consider in future. Right now, our goal is to uh, make sure the students can understand the topic in the best way possible. Maybe in future, when we, we can experiment with a few English language courses to see uh, the, how much uh, responses we get from the students. And obviously, we're dealing with a very different population, but very similar issue. I mean, the reason we launched Idrak is 80% of the Arab world doesn't speak English. So anything in terms of edX, Coursera, is completely not available to them. But when we polled people, and this is not a very good example, so only 2,000 people, 47% uh, said, you know, we want your next course to be on teaching us English. This sort of echo. So I wanted to know, if, have you actually sort of asked people if they want to learn English? Because for us, you know, we're working on creating on all these Arabic courses because yes, in the short term, they're not going to be able to access anything mm -hmm. if they don't learn, if we don't provide the content in Arabic. Yeah. But for them, whether it's sort of career aspirations, and we haven't dug deeper, we just ask, you know, what is the number one course you want to provide? And everybody's saying, you know, we want to learn English. Well, we didn't specifically ask them if they want to learn English, but we do have um, a course on learning English vocabulary, specifically for taking uh, TOEFL or ILTS. And that course is very, very popular. We have, I think, 6,000 people sign up for that course. Uh, so I guess that answers part of your question. And the other thing I want to point out that uh, a lot of these surveys have some caveats because uh, you are polling a target, uh, a, an, a population who definitely has access to the internet. Maybe they already know English. So your survey results might be skewed. It will be really good to do an offline survey involving the actual students uh, who might not speak English. So an alternative approach also is a data driven approach, which is to see which either works better, either experimentally or just correlationally. One thing that I've been doing a little bit is looking at difference in performance on problems between students in the developing world and students in the US. So that correlates with linguistic issues, uh, cultural issues. Uh, Gene per capita obviously is different. And as I look at this, there were about 500 problems with genetics, where students in the US were out the world, so it's be more by about 20%. The vast majority of them, performance was very similar, but there was a small set. And now, kind of diving into that, improving those problems and iterating on that, there's a question as to whether, which of those, how we can sort of combine the approaches, local content and data for the approaches to improve that. Developer in her and we have a 
have a lot of students who are really invested in getting a certificate and having something to show for the work they've done. And I'm curious if you've developed a mechanism for giving people that kind of mm -hmm. certified sense of accomplishment or if there's been a demand for that. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because that's definitely something a lot of people have asked us. Uh, am I going to get something like a certificate which I can use uh, to get a job? And right now, uh, since we are not a physical organization, we, can, we ha did not start uh, providing these certificates. But what we did was to partner with local universities in Bangladesh. Uh, for example, we have a partnership with the top engineering school in Bangladesh, uh, where uh, they are teaching a mobile application development short course. And students who participate on the, uh, in all the uh, lectures, as well as submit uh, the homeworks, do the project they'll get a course completion certificate from that university. It's not an official degree, but it's still a, something that makes the students happy. Yeah. Do you encourage students to engage with each other offline? So like in their rural areas, do you encourage them to work together to um, use each other as resources? Well, uh, right now, um, a lot of the students do engage with each other on uh, social media, for example, on Facebook. We haven't uh, got to the phase where we can uh, encourage the students um, to do uh, like offline, real life collaborations. But maybe that's something we can think about in future. Are people using that technique in these kinds of situations? So for one of our other X courses on public health, we um, download like the available video and then we use it to started something um, uh, with uh, schools. For example, uh, we just uh, talked to a principal of a school in a really rural area, right in the heart of the Sundarbans jungle. He um, wanted to get our courses on DVD. So what we're doing is to send the, all the course lectures to, in DVDs to them. And they can uh, show, they can have a special class after school in their school for the students and then encourage the students to um, use that material. But definitely this is a very good idea. Maybe we can explore that. Okay. About sort of the certification because that's the number one thing everybody's asking for. You know, they want a piece of paper that they can print and you know, then even we send it to them, we're like, you know, this is not signed by the instructor. <laughs> <laughs> so my question just ties back to sort of how you're getting the courses in. Is, is there, are you thinking sort of any quality assurance mechanism that then you can go and take to a degree institution and you say, you know, this course was one reviewed by these people before mm -hmm. it went online, and then is there something like that? Um, since we are very new uh, right now, uh, I'm doing all the quality assurance in terms of um, uh, like teaching style and lecture quality and so on. But in terms of contents, we do have some, from time to time, I would ask an expert in any particular area. For example, we have a um, math professor uh, who taught one of our courses. We, I, I often ask him to evaluate other math courses. Uh, is the course going on well or not? So that's a way of doing quality control. And uh, in, in other cases, uh, I, think the students can do the best quality control because if they have two courses on the same topic, the best one will probably be more popular with the students. So uh, it's kind of so like a I have a discussion on that, on that. There's a hypothesis. You, Rajiv has posed a hypothesis. I'm curious what the rest of the room, what, from, either from your experience or whatever, so what you think about that. something you said earlier, though, about the, um, mix, the, the specific relevance for the curriculum. Mm -hmm. For especially for things that actually have things related to curriculum, 
Mm -hmm. And so like one of the things that we found is that stuff that we were doing, we were doing an algorithms course, okay? So the evaluation, the way that you pass the course and the actual exam set by the universities is terrible. Um, and it doesn't really show any kind of evidence that you've mastered algorithms. Now, you know, we as a computer science organization, we really care about this. We care about that you actually master the material. Well, the students are like, I don't give a damn yeah. uh, because I, I want to pass the course. And so you're giving me all this extra crap that's, that's not going to help me pass. And so it's a, it's a really difficult thing to, to get straight there. Yeah, so that, that brings me to... That, that also reminds me of the question um, that what students say they want and what they actually want are sometimes different. We, I did not mention a, a survey result I just recently got where I asked, uh, do you want to study just to pass the course and topics that are in the course curriculum or do you want to study for the sake of learning something? A huge majority of the students claim that they want to study for the sake of study. But in reality, if it doesn't help them to pass, they'll probably skip that course. So do you give like suggestions like for example say take these courses together or like you know to go from one level to the other because like you know people they might be interested in something they say they're high school students right mm -hmm. but you you want to round their education let's say mm -hmm. right? so they say these are older kids so they don't know what to take together for example like in high school you take like history and all this stuff but here they would just well, uh, at least for at least for programming languages, we do have um, a hierarchy of courses ranging from uh, the first few steps in programming all the way to object-oriented programming and others. So there, we suggest to, to students that to take these courses in this sequence. Um, but uh, for other courses, uh, we kind of leave the leave it up to the students. If they want uh, something, they can just grab it. Yeah. Um. So two questions. One is, do you do you know if your students are tending to take this uh, instead of going to a traditional university or college, or they're trying to sort of do something complementary? So that's question number one. Um, and then question number two is just about um, sort of opportunities for them to demonstrate their knowledge. Again, it seems like especially with technical like programming languages, like they're using app developer to sort of, sort of go to somewhere else to say like to to do what you're teaching them to do. Um, do you ever get requests for uh, more feedback on that kind of work to say, like, I want somebody to look at my app or look at my code and like, help me out with it because like, that's what I'm running into trouble? Yes, so students um, would often uh, talk uh, or request the teacher for help like that. For example, if they're creating a mobile app or they're doing uh, uh, like a graphics design, they would often request the teacher to help them out with a particular problem or so on. And uh, what's the first question again? What do you do about that when they, oh, yeah. when they make the request? <laughs> well, it's up to the teacher because they uh, are volunteers. The teachers are volunteers. They are not supposed to answer to or spend a lot of time on the students. But uh, sometimes I've noticed that other students, if, if they post this on the course's uh, Facebook page or the Facebook comment sections, sometimes other students would step in and help the student in that particular problem. And uh, the other, I think you mentioned something about uh, whether the students are taking courses instead of going to actual schools. In some cases, that is precisely what's happening because some people who are outside the traditional education system because of poverty or something else, they often learn uh, something uh, through our um, courses. An example was later I got it from a student who had to drop out of um, high school, drop out of studying after high school because he couldn't afford to go to colleges. He said that his uh, dream was to become a computer engineer, but he is now working as a computer operator in a village uh, computer shop. So he's very happy to have these courses because in his spare time, he can just uh, learn a new topic uh, going through our courses. So this is uh, a broader question for everyone in the room. But so um, I'm very interested in, so what you've done is you know, obviously think about the local context and the local language. But there's a lot of people out there developing open educational resources under Creative Commons licenses. And depending on where that content originates, it's in its own local, you know, has its own local cultural um, artifacts within that content. So I was just wondering about any lessons learned or, you know, something I've been thinking about a lot is how to best make those materials so that they can be used in a variety of contexts by a variety of students um, or people from the US from whatever country. So, you know, the ones I've developed are 
you know, they are in English. Um, they definitely have cultural intonations from, from the US. Um, we were actually developing these videos, though, to be used in Singapore at an English-speaking university. So we did try to think about, about the sort of cultural references as much as possible. And we still did get some feedback from students that you know, some things were still very US. <laughs> um, like. So any lessons learned from anybody here in the audience about you know, experiencing, experience developing open educational resources and how can we make them to be best repurposed by others for cost-effective um, for educational dissemination? Question before. You also say what things were very US, what kind of things are read into? I think, you know, so we always try to use real world examples to highlight the, there were videos in the STEM areas to highlight the concepts for students, you know, both for motivational reasons and to, and to give concrete examples uh, of the content in use. And so, so because of, I think, just some of those, those concrete examples, even though they were science and engineering examples, for, for some students, they felt like, well, we're not familiar with that because of where we live. Those, those examples don't necessarily resonate with us as much. So um, dogs pulling a, a sled in the snow, for example. <laughs> students in Singapore <laughs> don't see the snow. You know, so, so I mean, little things. You know, that of course, they can, they can understand that, but, that, but this is not, you know, they don't, that's not their environment. Well, so. so I'm from Texas. I don't know about dogs and snow. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll say, uh, I'll actually expand the problem a little bit, yeah. which is to say that uh, even within the U.S. and the statistics course that we have in, in OLI, we've got a lot of requests for examples that are specific to, to specific disciplines. So uh, right. we try to create. We, we we took this into you know, into, into account when we created the course and try wherever possible to make the examples and activities very general. Mm -hmm. uh, but even so, we've got a lot of requests for nursing statistics, yeah. business statistics, yeah. and I actually think that speaks to one of the the, the importance of the technology is we do have the ability now to create. Uh, so I guess I don't know how far we go down the general path versus how, how much we create multiple examples and multiple pathways to the content that are familiar to people in different, uh, in, in different areas to address that problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that we're, actually out of, we're actually out of time. So, but thank you all for uh, coming to this uh, session and I hope the conversation continues over lunch. Thank you for being here.